Um, welcome everyone listening to this uh, recording, which will be about uh, GTD and learning disabilities. And I'm really happy to have uh, two experts joining me on this uh, topic, uh, Meg Edwards and, and Frank uh, Suffer. Uh, a pleasure to talk to you both. Um, you're both very familiar to, to everyone in the GTD community, but uh, this may also reach people outside the uh, global GTD community. So maybe you could give a quick introduction of, of who you are. Frank? Uh, well, I've uh, uh, been a, a career educator, so I've been, uh, I uh, uh, started uh, uh, teaching uh, young children uh, back in the early 80s, and then I've uh, worked my way up the age scale <laughs> uh, over, over the years. And uh, my interest was in uh, first how we acquired language, then how we acquired reading. And then that took me into all of the ways that we as humans struggle with uh, with those things, and uh, and with uh, that's a very long story for perhaps another time. <laughs> uh, came out the end uh, looking at in general how we as humans manage and transfer information. So that's been my life's work is how we as humans manage and transfer information and all of the uh, the uh, uh, ways we, we make that happen. Um, I come at this from a personal standpoint because I was one of those individuals that had a hard time <laughs> with what Frank just described um, all the way through until my mid-20s. And uh, it wasn't until I actually went to uh, the the, it was back then, it was called Managing Actions and Projects Seminar in 1999 with David, when he um, put on the screen the workflow diagram. And I felt for the first time, my brain had a path of thinking through something. Never had had that. And uh, so I come at this from a very personal standpoint because I wasn't tested until I was in, I think, 25, that I um, had learning challenges and attentional issues that, that got kind of figured out kind of later and never really um, had a construct and a paradigm to understand it. And the teachers were always befuddled all the way through. So um, after I uh, took the seminar, I then actually went through one-on-one -on -one coaching um, and uh, found um, that adding the getting things done methodology uh, was just a game changer for me. Great. Um, so thank you both for your introductions. And um, just to um, to share with everyone why we're actually here. Um, the reason is that, or where it started for me at least, was that I was searching for information on GTD and, and learning differences after coming across uh, various people in Denmark with uh, these uh, learning disabilities or challenges who have benefited greatly from, uh, from GTD. And I also coached uh, a very impressive young entrepreneur uh, in Denmark who was diagnosed with ADHD and uh, some of the, the challenges that we had working together uh, setting up a system a GTD practice that worked for him uh, made me interested in this topic and, and learning more about it so I asked in the GTD community both of your names came up um, so, so I'm really excited to, about this call to to learn more about this topic and, and understand it better. So, um, like I said to you as well before we, we started this, that I've prepared a couple of questions uh, and I'll let you both answer as you prefer uh, with your topics of, or areas of experiences, but, you know, feel free to go out on, on tangents and, and dive into to related topics as it, uh, as it makes sense. So we, um, we had a uh, chance to talk about this when we met last time in Amsterdam, where we agreed that the starting point for this conversation would be to help people understand the different types of learning disabilities. And I remember you mentioning, Meg, that there were even, I think, three different processes when, when, when talking about dyslexia, for example. I don't know if it makes sense for you or Frank to maybe start us off in, in that area. Frank, why don't you start, and then I can always come in with some of the personal examples and then the professional examples that I've seen with clients. Sure. I think what you're referring to, Lars, is when we read, when we process text, uh, the, it's a three-step process. Our eyes search and find the letter or word, identify the letter as a word as a symbol, and identify that symbol as a sound. 
And so as we're moving through a page of text, we're doing that hundreds and thousands of times, you know, searching for the next word, identifying the letters within that word, identifying the letters of sound. And, um, and when we've automatized that process, it's analogous to driving at high speeds down a highway. So the red light comes on in front of you, you recognize it as a brake light, you take your foot off the accelerator, put it on the brake for exactly the right amount of pressure for the right amount of time to come to a safe stop. And when all of that works optimally, it happens in the 30th of a second. Well, that's once our reading is automatized and the search and find identify it as a symbol, identify it as sound, is happening in microseconds as we're going through pages and pages and pages. Uh, we've, um, what's called a, le a learning difficulty in reading is a gap in any one of those three. And if we have, a, and it could be any one of the three, <laughs> uh, 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 could be, uh, uh, less easily operational for us. So for some, it's the search. For some, it's the it's the sound symbol uh, relationship. Um, and and um, and when you have all three, then it's then that's more profoundly challenging. Um, and if you're teaching somebody to read who's struggling to read, you want to be looking at those three and seeing where. Uh, where the gaps may be, may be showing up. So it's not that someone globally doesn't read or doesn't read easily. It could be a, a struggle with automatizing any one of those three processes, any two or any three, which is what makes it so challenging to diagnose. <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, so you mentioned three different types of processes now. How how many are there, or, or this, is that a is that the starting point to sort of identify these difficulties? Yeah, Meg. Anything you'd, you'd add to that, or well, some... yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that will show up as a coach is that if a client says to a coach, you know, hey, I I by the way, you know, I was diagnosed with dyslexia, or I have some challenges with reading or writing, or whatever that is. You know, I always just think that this is an opportunity as a coach just to probe. You don't have to be an expert, just ask some questions. You know, just ask things like, um, so tell me a little bit more about that. Or, or um, if somebody was coaching me, so like if you were coaching me, it's like, well, how does, that, how does that impact your work? It's like, well, you know, I have to read this document <laughs> and it just sits there, right? You know, it just sits on my, my list or I have a big read and review stack that I never get to. You know, they'll, they'll kind of link it to something very tangible. And then as a coach, how do you come up with the strategy? Because obviously I'm stuck and I don't have a strategy, but you don't really have to know the expertise that Frank has. It's just probing and asking questions. <laughs> And I think that that's one of the things I get on the forums is, is, is coaches will say, oh, I'm working with a client who told me that they were dyslexic or ADD. And I'm like, well, I don't know what that means. That's so global. And, and by asking questions, I think then that will really help the coach and the client come up with those solutions that they might benefit from. So Frank, does that what is that? How does that sound to you? Or what? Uh, no, that's exactly right. It's uh, it's what shows up uh, for people, and they're either uh, reading averse or reading acquisitive, <laughs> and, uh, and that's really all you all you have to know uh, from a coaching standpoint. Uh, and there is that one more there is that one more piece, Lars, that you're asking about. Uh, so when we when we engage that three-step process it's a little bit like our our brain is running through a maze and for some of us as we run through that maze that's an energizing experience and for others of us it's an energy depleting experience and we can be very good at it and it's still energy depleting and we can have all kinds of difficulties with it and it's energy engaging, that solving that puzzle can be engaging even if it's extremely difficult, or it can be relatively easy and solving the puzzle is um, energy depleting. So that's one more complexity. And mostly what we see in the coaching level is, is it, 
it does it raise your energy to process tax or does it deplete your energy to process tax? And it really doesn't matter how well you do it. <laughs> if it depletes your energy, uh, uh, you're going to struggle with going through your inbox, your email inbox. Uh, and if it raises your energy, well, it might take you a little longer, but you're, it's, uh, it's, you're going to go and engage it. It'll be, you know, you're, you're, it uh, won't be a problem to, to, to do what it takes to get through that inbox. Because, that right, Meg? yeah, no, it's perfect. Cause this is what we see as coaches. We don't see all the stuff that they got done. <laughs> Right? We don't see all the paper that they clarified and organized, the emails that they clarified and organized, the, the next actions that they did. We see what they haven't. So when you look at the inbox, usually all that stuff has depleted their energy or that piece of paper. You know, they pick it up and they're like, I don't know what it is. And so this is the beauty about really coming up with the strategy. And so, you know, there are folks that have assistance and there are folks that don't have assistance, right? So when clients have an assistant, that's like a game changer because this is where I'm always thinking outside of the box as a coach, right? So let's say that a client has an assistant. I'm like, I'll bring that assistant in, have them do the reading. And then if that client also has a high talking preference, as the two of them work together, then they don't fatigue as much, the client. So it's really kind of thinking, I'm always like, think outside of the box. Um, this is where I remember the first time that I actually had an assistant sit down at the typewriter and do the typing, do the data entry and let the client not have to fatigue with the reading and the writing because usually there's a fatigue factor that sometimes happens a lot faster or a spelling. Sometimes there's also spelling challenges. I worked with a client who was a senior VP that it was arduous for him to write out a project and project planning because the spelling was so hard for him. So we're like, okay, let's just think outside of the box because he still needed to capture, clarify, and organize. But those learning challenges that were very chronic and pervasive were just so depleting his energy so, so more quickly than maybe other clients or have them take more frequent breaks. But everybody's so different. If you took 50 people and they all said that they were dyslexic. They're all really different because A, they all have different cognitive preferences. So who are the, the folks that have a sequential preference and might be dyslexic, a dual processor that might be dyslexic, a high associative that might be dyslexic. It, you've got to, again, I don't mean to sound like a broken record. You just got to ask questions. They know where they get stuck because we're not working with little kids, we're working with adults. I know where I get stuck all the time. And Frank is the one that would always unstick me. You know, I was the one that was always like giving the presenting issue and then Frank would come up with some like great strategy and I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, do you have an example of that for if someone's coaching and wants to know how to? Um... Well, oh, for example, this, this is really great. So when I was first coached, I had all this email, you know, email this person, email this person, email this person. And I would try to give feedback, right? Like I get an email and I would sit there for 40 minutes trying to articulate an email, right? Instead of just saying, let's hop on the phone. Right. Let's get an appointment. I have no business writing a long email, just none. <laughs> if you want anything from me, it should be done verbally. And so, so I remember the first time where David emailed this email to all the coaches. And at the end, he said, Meg, let's set up a time to talk. The way that I give information is not through writing. It's not the way that, that's not the best way to get information from me. It's verbal. Hence, that's why I've been on all those GTD Connect you know, um, webinars. That's why you never see anything from me in writing. So unless it's a very simple email back to somebody, great, let's talk today at 2.15. Anything more is much better for me to, to use other strengths that I have than reading and writing. Or for example, if I have to read a big document, this is another strategy. I get a big contract from a client where we have to do a statement of work. And Frank was just like, forward it to the lawyer. They will read it. They will let you know if... Um, they need to uh, revise anything. So that's a delegating. 
And even if I had the skill to do it, I might miss things or a client might miss things. So is there somebody else that could do that for me? And then I could do another part of that thinking. So even Frank came up with that last week, which is no, forward it to the lawyer where I would make it a next action. And I would spend like an hour or two or three hours trying to read through it. And you have to make the distinction between, is it a skill issue or is it really a, um, a learning challenge issue? And, and it wasn't a skill issue for me because Frank was training me up on what to look for with the contract. But now it gets into no matter how hard I work, I'm probably going to miss things. So then, hence, I have a strategy. Makes sense. Certainly makes sense. So how do you, how do you, is there any way to, to spot it? You, you mentioned that, that most people know where they struggle. And I'm just, uh, as you're saying that I'm trying to, to spot that for myself and also for the people that I work with that I'm not, um, I'm not sure I would always spot them. Is there any sort of specific way? How, what, what are you looking for? For example, just specific parts of GTD where, you know, people normally stall if there's something that they don't do well. Well, you know, when I'm training coaches, one of the things that I'm always looking for is, is remember we talk about that things either attract or repel you. <laughs> so if I write a next action to email David, blah, 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 and it repels me, I haven't landed on the right next action. Hmm. See, so it really transcends learning and attentional issues. When you ask somebody at the end, does that attract or repel you? Because these are focusing lists. And now when you're going to do work, you're just looking at the options to say, well, which one do I want to do right now? But if a lot of those repel you as a coach, you've got to lean into the client to find out why that repels them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, it, and, it, uh, and, and this is where I really take it away from identifying it as a learning disability, because that pathologizes it, um, where uh, it attracts or repels, uh, I feel is a much more useful uh, way of, of looking at it. So uh, 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 my father uh, doing dishes attracted him. The end of dinner, he actually enjoyed being alone in the kitchen. You know, everybody else went off somewhere else. And he would just, you know, it, and he enjoyed that. It was a relaxed way for him to relax and, uh, and uh, be focused. I don't like doing that at all. Now, I don't have a doing dishes disability. <laughs> Completely <laughs> capable of doing it. My father didn't have any particular skill or <laughs> aptitude for doing dishes. It just, for him, it, um, it was energizing. And for me, it's, it's depleting. Uh, why is that? No idea. <laughs> but... Uh, but really, that's what that's when we say, look at the client, you know, what activates them, um, uh, what repels them. And then uh, we have to do all kinds of things um, that repel us. So I, you know, I have to clean up after myself all the time, <laughs> um, uh, uh, even though that's not a, not necessarily as energizing for me. So we have to do a certain amount of that stuff. Uh, but um, but it's important um, to see uh, you know it, it's uh, well I, what I like what I prefer to do is not to have people do self blame oh I'm you know I'm I I have a disability or I have low character or, or I'm less moral or less careful than somebody else oh it it, it doesn't raise your energy so um, uh, if you have to do it then what's the strategy for for moving that stuff forward if you have to do it. Um, so the other, so where that shows up for me is I actually have pretty high aptitude for processing text. So that search identifies a symbol, identifies a sound, actually is highly fluid for me, but I don't get a stimulus for doing it. Um, so it actually tires me out, even though I'm highly capable of doing it. So 
Uh, so it's a paradox. You know, do I have a reading disability? No. Do I have a, a low stamina for processing text? Yes. Um, uh, why is that? No idea. <laughs> Say my, why is it my father got relaxed doing dishes? For me, it's a chore. No idea. Um, uh, but but what I do is, so if I have to read that contract that Meg's talking about, I've told my colleagues, I can read that contract in 10 hours. I can't read it in two. So I can't sit down with that contract between 11 a.m. and noon and, and do a thorough read of it, or sit down after lunch between 1 and 2 and do a thorough read of it. Um, I have to take 10 or 15 minutes, you know, when I start the day, do a close read of a couple of paragraphs, bookmark it, do something else, then go back, do 15 or 20 minutes, do a close read of that, do something else, come back, do 15 or 20 minutes of a couple of paragraphs, do something else. And by the end of the day, I will have done a very close and careful reading of that contract. But I've learned that I can't just sit down and do it in two hours where I know a contract attorney who told me when uh, she gets some fatigue in the middle of the afternoon, she sits down with a stack of contracts and literally gets buzzed. She gets a runner's high in processing contracts. <laughs> <laughs> I can only stand back and watch that in awe. I, I'm perfectly capable of reading that contract and reading it effectively, but I lose stamina for reading and she gains energy from reading. And, and see, and I, and I just delegate it. Right. I won't even, and I won't even touch it. Right. See, and, so, and so do you see, those are three different strategies, but you have to know yourself well enough. So it's that whole thing, how much metacognition does the client have? If somebody was coaching me, I have a whole lot now, but you know, 20 years ago, I didn't. I didn't really have, I never thought about strategies. I always thought about this brute force and I needed discipline. I needed to work harder. What was wrong with me? And so if you get a client like this, this is a beautiful gift to be able to really support them on coming up with those strategies to give themselves permission to probably do things that they've always known that they wish that they could do. They just haven't done it. You know, because at the end of the day, if I, if I put down, if Lars, again, if you were coaching me and I put down on my next actions list to read the contract and you said to me, does that attract or repel you? And I said, that repels me. Okay, now you have to keep coaching me. Hmm. You haven't landed on the next action. So regardless of whatever it is, see, now you would keep probing until I figure out something or I figure something out with you to be able to say, because remember, can you do it? delegate or defer it. Can't do it in less than two minutes. So you would ask me, well, could you delegate it to somebody? I'm like, wow, never even thought about that. Who could I delegate it to? <laughs> right? So now you stick within the GTD process because that will always, always, you will figure it out when you stay within that. If you, if a coach goes out and somehow they feel like they have to have some kind of expertise, that's where I always think kind of coaches get into trouble. And if you just stay with, okay, so, you know, you put that on your next actions list. Could you do that? And remember, sometimes the best practice is that if you can do it in one sitting less than an hour, you can put that on your next actions list, unless somebody has a whole bunch of time in their calendar all the time, but that's not the case, right? So a lot of people don't have a whole lot of time. So that's where Frank would have his strategy, where he has to do little pieces over the day. Right. And you would, again, if you're coaching with me on that contract and I'm like, well, you know, I would say, Lars, I could spend all day looking at that contract. I'll never figure it out. Okay. Now you got to keep coming back. So you keep coming back. You keep coming back. You keep coming back until you land on something. And I've never not been able to figure it out with a client, <laughs> but you stay within that clarifying and organizing. You stay within those best practices don't feel like you have to be an expert in whatever they share. Um, mm. And you, you will figure it out and co-create it with the client and they will be just so grateful at that time to be able to slow that down and to really unpack what is it really like for me to have a trusted system where everything on that list is something that I can do. And that, that isn't usually the case with people. 
Mm, yeah. So Frank, you mentioned that, you know, we have these, uh, the things that we do that, that tire us out. Is there anything we can do to, so, so you mentioned the strategy to adapt to that. So, so splitting up your reading into to smaller parts, uh, can we impact that, uh, our abilities in, in, in some, some smarter ways? Yeah. So, um, so, uh, you know, I was just thinking about the, you know, the, the doing dishes analogy. So I get energy from working collaboratively and from meeting challenges. So if I got the task of, uh, of cleaning up after Christmas dinner, I'd want to get my sister and my cousin together to do it as a team and would want to beat the family record forever for the fastest job in cleaning up <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. And then it would be fun for me. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of it is just finding, you know, so what does motivate you? What raises your energy? And, um, and so doing it as a solitary activity uh, uh, would be depleting, but uh, doing it uh, collaboratively and, uh, and trying to uh, achieve a challenge you know, <laughs> uh, uh, would be highly, ener the same activity then would be highly ener energizing for me. And so a lot of times it, it's, um, it's, it's finding, um, those things. So Meg, you actually, you've, when you talked about people working with assistants or working with colleagues, you found that, that when uh, uh, people, for instance, doing the weekly review, which is very hard for some people to do as a solitary practice, uh, when people, well, go ahead, you can talk. No, exactly, exactly. It, it's that they just do, I sometimes say to people, you have no business doing very much by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> When we talk about like high engager, highly engaging, highly inquisitive, that they do better when they do things in meetings, when they, when they do, when they find somebody to do the weekly review together, you know, that, that just all of a sudden everything's just firing. Like Frank was saying, if you put Frank in the kitchen by himself, you know, it's kind of like it just depletes his energy, but set him up in a way that, that is, is going to be engaging for him, then actually he's much more efficient and effective. So again, most people know uh, what doesn't work for them. They know that if they, um, some people do better with doing some work in a cafe. Some people do better doing a weekly review where there's actually some noise and some stimulation going on around them. Some people that's not the case. So again, you're always trying to figure out how to, how to do the parts of GTD that aren't gonna be arduous and shouldn't be brute force and that shouldn't be disciplined. When they say, I just need more discipline or I just need to get motivated, I'm always like, time out. No. It shouldn't be arduous. It shouldn't be brute force. It should be something that attracts them that they can't wait to do the weekly review. For me, I've always had to do my weekly review in parts because I fatigue so much. So my weekly review is done in segments and that's what attracts me. And periodically I can do an, uh, a weekly review in one setting, but I fatigue too much. Um, for a variety of reasons. One is because I'm a dual processor. And so I have a tendency to fatigue a little bit more. So again, if you hear a client where they're getting tired or they use those kind of vocabulary words that I just men mentioned, the coach should really lean into it and figure out something else. Makes sense. What, um, what are the most common learning challenges that you've come across, Meg, um, and how have, you, how have you solved them? Is there any way sort of to overall describe what, what would be most common for coaches to, to run into? Um, well, so in terms of the learning challenges, it's the reading and it's the writing and it's the processing information. So for example, if somebody has challenges processing, maybe they have a note taker in meetings so that they can just actually listen to the meetings. Again, the client will tell you where their breakdown is. They'll tell you, but, but um, writing, um, I dictate to somebody and they do the writing. You know, I just avoid writing at all costs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about teaming with somebody. This is what's so great about teaming with Frank, where we just got together last week and I can give him things verbally and then he writes things or I can email him and say, hey, here's a situation here. Can you write a template? And he'll write it. 
And so it's about finding your team. It's about finding your support network, you know, and so that you can thrive in the skill of your job. And, and I think that that's something that a coach should be looking for, which is where their team is. So I've always had a team of people that do reading for me. They do writing for me. I can run things by them. I can talk things out to them. I have this whole team so that I can thrive. And so as a coach, you just want to be paying attention to where are they not thriving? And again, try to come up with those solutions. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I remember when I, when I asked the question in the, in the forums, one of the uh, Dutch trainers, Frank, Goodhart. So, sorry, Frank, I'm going to mispronounce your name likely. He, he went in uh, with, with some of his experience there, and he, one of his challenges was to implement the process to the point where they became habits for him. So turning them into, like you mentioned also, Frank, turning them into automatic ways of working was just not easy. So one of his tips was always to have sort of the support material handy. Um, like what were the options for the clarify step, for example. That was, uh, that was one of the things that worked well for him. Um, what about the lists? Because that's where, so when, when to, to get the overview and, and, um, I know we've, we've spoken about the contents of the lists, but also to make it maybe more visually appealing for some people, at least that's what I uh, found with, uh, with, with the entrepreneur that I mentioned initially that, that we had to work a bit on setting up a system for him that was much more visually appealing. So, so that meant some, some colors, some, uh, emojis, uh, so, you know, uh, much more you know, visual than than me. I, I like my lists, you know, just one by one, all the way down. Keep it, keep it, uh, keep it simple. Um, I guess that that's part of what you've come across as well. Well, I think that gets a little bit more into people's cognitive preferences than in their learning challenges. Mm, yeah. So, so I think sometimes there's a little bit of an interface there. Where is it might be their learning challenges, and where it may also be their cognitive preferences that they might like to have things. So for example, I have something called dysgraphia, which is, it literally is also physically painful for me to write things down. Hence, I'm, my lists are electronic because thank goodness I can type. Mm. And so, um, so I landed on OmniFocus a long time ago because it, it, it satisfies the dual processor so I can see things sequentially and I also think can see things like my projects attached to my um, my actions and my next actions and my dependent actions, and I can type. And so there are other people though that I know that they need to write it by hand in order for them to remember it. So hmm. again, not one size is going to fit everybody here. You have to kind of probe and hopefully if somebody does share that they have learning and attentional issues, I highly recommend that they take the focus survey because it's going to give you much more specific information about where they fall on associative, sequential, dual processor, high engagers, where their observer is. It's going to give the coach much more specific language to mm -hmm. then coach them through than just saying, oh, it's my dyslexia or, oh, it's my ADD, oh, it's my ADD. I'm like, I don't know what that means when they say, oh, that's my ADD. Mm -hmm. That's another and thing we can talk about is when somebody says, oh, I have ADD. <laughs> Frank and I have got some thoughts on that one too, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's dive into that one then. <laughs> you want to go first, Frank, on that one? No, you brought it up and then I'll throw in. You, uh, yeah. Well, I think that what's really fascinating about the piece, and I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but when I have a client that says that they were diagnosed with ADD and they take the focus survey, is that there are folks that have been diagnosed with ADD that fall within the sequential preference, the dual processor preference, and the high associative preference. And one of the things that I really see is differential attention, a surplus of attention a lot of the times. So when they're doing emails, you know, let's say that somebody was diagnosed with ADD and they have an associative preference. Um, I don't want to fight that preference. So I may not just have them go one email at a time, <laughs> right? Then they might really fatigue. I'll be like, go clarify and organize all those emails that are the two minute rule or the ones that you can delete or the ones that you can make quick decisions on, right? And then what we're left with is they usually have to dial up the sequential and dial up the reader and kind of slow things down and leave their associative preference and come into the sequential preference. 
But until they have that framework, they just say, oh, it's my ADD. Oh, it's my ADD. I just can't pay attention. I just can't focus. Well, what's so fat, what's very interesting in the ADD community is I've never seen anybody really answer the question, why can somebody pay attention to this for three hours and they pay attention to this for five minutes? And they'll say, well, I have ADD because I can't pay attention to this. And I'm like, well, no, that's really differential attention. What is it that you have to do? Like, they haven't done their expense reports. You know, that's what I see. And it's like, oh, it's my ADD. I can't do my expense reports. Or, oh, it's my ADD. You know, I struggle with this. Oh, it's my ADD. And again, that, that doesn't really help anybody. It doesn't certainly help the coach with that. So there's kind of like another layer to be able to help them, to give them a, a, um, something much more specific that they can, they, can, um, they can latch onto for strategies to help them get out of that situation. Yeah, but yeah but it's so interesting how it shows up. So you can have the person who can uh, put uh, full attention on, on one thing for a year and say, say the person's a chemist, can put full attention on a chemical reaction for a year, put a uh, full attention on the consequent uh, chemical reaction for a year, third year, the, the next chemical reaction. At the end of 20 years, they've only paid attention really to 20 things, but, um, but they are, are awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry because those were 20 really significant <laughs> points of attention. But if you sit next to their children at the Nobel Prize dinner, you'll find out that mom, dad didn't really spend a lot of time with them because mom or dad didn't have divergent attention. You know, they had this very tight focus convergent attention, which was highly adaptive, but that's the person who after 20 years needs the graduate student to lead them out of the building when the fire alarm goes off because they've never paid attention to an alternative way of getting out of the building in 20 years. You know, they don't have that divergent attention. And then we have people who have uh, beautiful uh, divergent uh, attention and uh, you know, have this great broad curiosity. But then as they say, when they have to do the expense report, that's convergent attention. And they're trying to hold their attention on this, but that divergent attention is bringing their awareness of all the things that are still flying around them. So they keep getting pulled over into that divergent attention. Um, so which one of these people is attention deficit? And what would that, what does attention deficit even mean in those circumstances? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're really looking for. Um, there, um, there is a, a kind of what I would call a true attention deficit where someone just has a, 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 a condition where they can't focus. But that's a very debilitating condition. You don't see people running large organizations with that condition. Um, um, uh, what, what, what most of us are calling attention deficit isn't anything close to that. Um, um, it's um, uh, it's really I have attention for this thing I don't have attention for that thing and for me as a reader how I just described do I have attention deficit for reading no I can have very intensive focused attention for 10 or 15 minutes of reading I don't have attention for two hours of reading um, but I can do two hours of reading in 10 hours. So what does that mean? <laughs> um, is that an attention deficit? No, I need to distribute my attention. I have very tightly focused attention, but it exhausts. So then I need to just let it renew and, 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 uh, and distribute it over time. Um, what, thank you, Frank. One of the things that I think is so important for the coach to know and to reframe when a client says that they have attentional issues is that it's not that they can't do it. It's at what cost does it come? Mm -hmm. 
So when I have a client who says that they have ADD and they're not, they haven't done their expense reports for three months. And it's like, at what, and, it, and then, and, or I get a lot of it that they feel like they, they should be able to do it. I should be able to do my expense reports. I should be able to do this. I should be able to do this. I should be able to do this. I should. I'm like, it's not that you can't do it. It's the cost that it comes to do it. Now we have a very different conversation about delegation. I mean, I can't tell you in the 20 years that I've been doing GTD coaching, how many people have hired somebody to help them do those things that come at a cost. And they've had to have some real serious conversation with their spouses, for example, because their spouses are saying, well, you should be able to do this. You, I can do it, so you should be able to do it. And when they reframe it and say, yes, I could do it, but the cost that it comes to do that, now, now there can be a much different conversation and an understanding to be able to say, I'm going to hire somebody to do that. Or if I can't and I need to do that, what's my strategy? Understanding that it's not that I can't do it, it's the cost that it comes to do it. So I was working with another gentleman that had this call list and he wasn't making any of the phone calls. And again, it had, and he, had, he didn't share that he had learning and attentional issues, right? So he was just like, he had all these calls that he needed to make. And I'm like, you can make all those calls, but you also could have your assistant make all those calls and set up the time. Well, we actually now got into a, another conversation about that he thought that it was, it was the, the, um, the client thought that the perception of an assistant making a phone call to set up a time was not going to look good. See, so again, we leaned into that and then he realized, no, actually, it really is okay for her to set up all those calls. So then all of a sudden we got rid of that whole list and he just felt so much better. So again, it's the probing of the coach to not let that just go and to, to really ask those questions. And, and it comes at such a great cost to him. It had nothing to do with his learning and attentional issues. But for people that do have learning and attentional issues, like for me, it comes at a great cost to write and to read. It comes at a great cost. I can do it, but it comes at a cost. So anytime I can delegate that out, I'm going to do that. And that's what I learned from Frank in terms of the reframing. Because uh, another way to call um, the work that we do is called behavioral economics. It's... Um, uh, and taking the uh, analogy from, uh, from macroeconomics, uh, each of us, because we have uh, a, a, our own set of awarenesses and filters for the information that's, that's coming at us, with the three of us can be standing at the same place at the same time looking in the same direction but we're taking a different sample of that information that's coming to us from our surroundings so i might see something meg might um, uh, hear something uh bars might be perceptive to the wind you know coming uh you know coming through or the breeze or the the aroma of the of the surroundings and each one of us may be responding to all of that stimulus in a, in a slightly different way or maybe sometimes it's slightly different and sometimes it's so different we can wonder if we're the same species um, but those differences in what catches our attention what can miss our attention what raises our energy what deplete our energy gives us our own set of comparative advantages the things that I can do at a lower energetic cost than the next person can do. And really what I want to be doing in my life are moving toward those things. So the same way certain businesses can do things at, um, more efficiently and effectively than the next business can do because of their maybe their location or their structure or their organization. Um, 
um, whole nations, you know, have certain comparative advantages because of their geography, because of uh, yeah, their historical development. They can do things that other more efficiently and effective than uh, effectively than people in other places can do. And um, and so uh, we really want to uh, be looking at at our own set of comparative advantages and trying to move that and then and then uh, to be leveraging you know the other person's comparative advantages. So if I'm uh, uh, if I'm going to um, if I need to find a, a child who's wandered off, I'm not going to look for the person. I'm not going to look for the Nobel Prize winning chemist. I'm going to get a bloodhound because the bloodhound's comparative advantage is being able to put its nose to the ground and pick up the scent. So, uh, so, uh, so we're gonna we're we're gonna uh, partner with that animal. Uh, to do that job, and we're going to delegate that responsibility uh, to, to that dog, and and we'll take on the responsibility of going to the supermarket and buying the dog food because that's not the dog's <laughs> comparative advantage, but but finding the lost child is the dog's comparative advantage. It it really sometimes is that simple uh, in what we're doing. <laughs> Um, I think we've covered many of my questions. One of the things was exactly that focus survey results and whether there was any sort of pattern that you could could spot. Uh, but but I think we we spoke about that in Amsterdam as well. That that uh, you know there wasn't really a, a specific uh, thing to to look for. There were all really different, as you also covered now, Meg. Um, is there anything we miss now uh, that we should still cover? Um, <clears throat> one last thing for my list was that I noted. Uh, I believe you contributed also with your knowledge about learning disabilities in relation to the GTD 14's book, Meg. Is that correct? Or maybe I, I noted down something wrong. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I worked on that project for a couple of years with David and Mike and then, um, but not any, I'm so sorry, nothing that mm -hmm. really, I think that, that um, what I, what I think I was sharing, I think at some point, is that sometimes um, when I was coached, I was coached in capture, clarify, and organize. That's what we call that bottom-up coaching, right? You start at the, the, the ground level, the project level, the areas of focus level. I would have done much better if somebody had started with the areas of focus level and flushed out all my areas of focus and then took an area of focus and then grabbed my projects and actions from that. That would have been a very systematic way to teach me GTD because my brain was so garbled, um, which is the case with a lot of people. And, and regardless if somebody said that they have attentional issues or, um, or learning challenges, a coach has got to figure out what's the path of, of installing GTD. If in doubt, if in doubt, start with areas of focus and then go down. Because if you capture everything just randomly, it can, it can and they're already feeling really especially garbled in the brain and they don't have a framework, you've possibly just exacerbated it. Mm. And so if in doubt, it is something that you might want to consider as a coach. I have, I've been doing that more and more and more and more anyways, um, with just starting with people's areas of focus and saying, okay, so you have a dog, are there any projects or actions to that? Any checklists that need to be created? Any lists that need to be created? Okay, your home, any projects, you know, your, um, um, you know, your friends and family, your health. It's a very nice systematic way of what I call doing a controlled mind sweep by doing it through areas of focus and responsibility. So if I had, po I think I might have also brought that up with the, with the team's book, 
because that's a nice way of saying, okay, so you, you have your academics or you have all your classes or you have your sports or you have your activities or any of that. And then any projects or actions get created from that. That might've been mm. where I, yeah. I talked that about probably. that, but it also is something that I do when I'm training is you've got to figure out, do you do bottom up or top down? Mm. Yeah. And that was one of the really, uh, I thought, interesting parts of the GTD, uh, GTD for Teens book with the transitioning of the areas of, of responsibility from, from parents to, to teens. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, that's what I had also said. Yes, because in the beginning, a parent owns all the kids' areas of focus and responsibilities. And as the child gets older, they have more roles and responsibilities and the parent has less of that than they may be monitoring it. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's it from my agenda list to uh, the two of you. Uh, I don't know if there's anything more we wanted to to cover or mention. No, I'm just so glad that you uh, really took the reins on this, Lars, and asked us yeah. to do this because it's it really has been an ongoing question for people. So really appreciate you taking the time too to to bring this um, together. Well, thank you for your time. Really, that was it's been really, really interesting. There's just um, so much to to think about. Uh, I think I need to at least coach myself uh, a bit more, uh, be more aware of this. Uh, maybe see if I can delegate to uh, some some other things that maybe uh, maybe are more uh, tiring for me. Um, thanks for your time, and um, yeah, really appreciate it.